Haifeng from CMU. Today I'm good like to, to present our work, Mobile Net, Mobile Binary Neural Network for image classification. Mobile Net and Binary Neural Network are two recent techniques to construct the deep learning model for performing the various start on the mobile platform. So in this paper, we propose the combination of depth wide convolution and the binary neural network called the MobiNet to create a more efficient model. Uh, however, the training is not easy. The challenge is that the, Mopi, the mobile net, the depth wide convolution is low cost but accurate. Besides, the binary neural network is extremely fast on the power hungry device when the weight value is constrained to the minus one and one. Uh, however, it's not accurate because of the poor capability of representation. Here is the architecture of the MobiNet. We modify the depth wide convolution to make it work efficiently with both activation and wave polarization. So, MobiNet is deployed additional points wide before the depth wide point wide. We connect the pre block between the depth wide point wide, the mid block, after the depth wide point wide, the post block. The purpose is that to increase the skip connection operation, making separable convolution layer to able to keep the original features. Uh, the MobiNet generalized the gradient update procedure adjusting the model way through the back propagation. The scaling factor for each filter are gradually tuned in the adaptive manner with respect to the gradient update. To further boost the performance of MobiNet, a channel dependency is applied to enhance the dependence within the input and convolution channel. The output of activation of the group can be computed in inner convolution operation within the channel and filter in the same group. Uh, we provide two application study, efficiency of the skip connection and proposed design block. In the left figure, the training log divert indicated a serious issue in the vanilla mobile binary right neural network. This, uh, it's confirmed that our hypothesis using the skip connection for separable convolution binarization can deal with the diversion issue of the lost information. Uh, in, in the right figure, conversion of the mobile net with the block is more stable and gain better accuracy while the width of block design fluctuate in the training. Okay, so we also compare with the state of the art methods. The best performance we achieve with the mid block design, uh, top one accuracy on inbuilt net is 54%, uh, and the speed up 11 times compared to the mo mobile net network. In the table, we show the efficiency of mobile net against several region model like XNONet, PyreNet, APCNet, et cetera. Our mobile net with the mid-block design achieved the speed up the factor of the three times. Furthermore, in terms of accuracy, I performed the previous binary models. So thank you. Uh, welcome to my poster in number 24 for additional result in discussion. Hi, I am Petru, and today I will talk about our method of uh, using curriculum learning for GANs. We want to do this in order to show that we can obtain better results in a more stable training, and we experimented on two tasks, generation and translation. Curriculum learning is the methodology used in all educational systems around the world, with the pupils learning the easiest concept at first, and then more and more difficult stuff. This can also be applied to automatic models. Our GAN framework, our framework is a bit different than the standard GAN in that uh, we use a difficulty predictor and then we, we get difficulty scores for the training images. We sort the real images by the difficulty and then we employ a curriculum learning strategy when training. Here are some examples of easy and difficult images. And we came up with three curriculum learning strategies. The first one is batching. We split the training set on, in three beach, batches uh, difficulty-wise. We start training on the easy images, then, then gradually add the medium difficulty and then the hard images. The second strategy is waiting. We compute an easiness score based on the difficulty. We build then a scoring function which favors the easier images in the first iterations, and then we add the new term to the last function. We see that the easiness score is between zero and two, and thus the training progresses, it converges to one. The last method is sampling. We build a distribution function based on the 
easiness score and the scoring function, and then we sample according to this distribution. This can be seen as a continuous version of the first method with batches. Here we can see that uh, our, all our methods beat the baseline SN GAN, and here are some results. We use classic methods like uh, inception score and FIID, while also asking human annotators which images look more real. For the translations results, we also used human annotators, and they said that our method is better than the baseline cycle again with over 20%. So that's it, our method indeed reaches faster convergence, more stable training and better results. Thank you. technique for difficult discrete energy minimization problems called order cut. The key idea behind order cut is the proposed mapping between the minger problem in the graph G and finding the shortest path in the directed day cycle graph D. D and G have the same set of nodes but different edge weights. Each path in D corresponds to a cut in G. Finding the optimal solution for the minger cut requires exploring all possible loading or trings of the nodes and is, and is NP hard. However, a suboptimal ordering can be efficiently found and the corresponding shortest path gives an approximate solution for the minker problem. We propose an efficient ordering of the nodes based on how likely is this for a node to switch its label. We further extend our approach by proposing an iterative move making algorithm for multi level second order effective graphs. The proposed algorithm is quite fast, but a little sensitive towards initialization, though we can still get state of the art results on certain, certain data sets. The key use case of our approach is as a post-processing technique for difficult second-order discrete energy minimization problems. This includes problems for which the unit terms are not very informative, or when the labor space is large, or when the underlying graph has high connectivity. In our comparative evaluation on the OpenGM benchmark, we showed that we can improve on the accuracy of the standard techniques for such problems with very little additional computational time. Here we report comparative evaluation uh, of order cut, iterative condition mode, and lazy flipper as post processing algorithms initialized on TRWS, PPS, and alpha expansion on MRF stereo dataset. This dataset has 16 to 60 labels and roughly 150,000 nodes. We use adaptive 2 for lazy flipper, whereas higher depths were intractable. With all three initializations, order cut works better than ICM and lazy flipper while it is considerably faster. Node 3D300 is a coalition trusting dataset with four to 6,000 nodes and has the same number of labels and it has high connectivity. With no unit terms, polyhedral methods fail to give a tight polytype relaxation and because of negative pairwise terms, maxflow based methods are not applicable. We use lazy flipper with the depth of one. For higher depths, it becomes intractable because of large label space and large connectivity. Order card demonstrates better accuracy with a considerable speed up on this data set. More comparisons are reported in the paper. We would make our source code public. Please contact the authors if you are interested. Thank you. Okay, good evening. My name is Mike Brody. Now, CoachGAN is an inference time output enhancement method. It takes five lines of code and it extends inference by under about a tenth of a second. Now, to motivate this, You'll see on the very left here, sometimes we sample a random vector, generate an output, you'll see it has partial glasses that aren't completed. What we're gonna do is exploit the discriminator at test time to be able to guide this vector to a slightly better output. How we do this, we take a vector, we're gonna pass it through, calculate a loss using the discriminator, back propagate through D, through G, and use that to update to a new Z. So now we have Z at time, T plus one, and then we just repeat this process from anywhere from five to up to 100 times, depending on how much time or how real time we need this. Now what happens, you can see intuitively, your D or your discriminator is defining this loss landscape and we're basically just descending slightly down to take a Z latent vector and just improve it slightly, which yields some nice improvements in our output. As you can see, 
We've got a basic trade-off between our learning rate and iterations along the diagonals there. Depending on how fast you need this to run, you just crank up the learning rate and you can speed up how fast we move. As bas a basic sanity check, we did test this against our training set just to make sure CoachGAN is not pushing us back towards, say, anything we saw in the original training. As for experiments, the bulk of our results use DCGAN, basically CELEBE, CIFAR-10, and LSUN. Now we also, in addition to these, tried several state-of-the-art high-resolution models, specifically progressive growing of GAN, style GAN, and uh, more recently, big GAN. Now for some qualitative results, first we'll look at some from uh, Celeb A. You'll see on the left we have our original, and then we move over, this is across 100 iterations. You notice we're removing a lot of the noise or these weird distortions in the face from the images. Next in Elsun, take a look at some of the corners of the bed or the pillows. You'll notice they become a little more refined and just a little bit better. Again, this takes less than a tenth of a second and it can give a nice improvement in your output. And finally, just for uh, fullness here, we have progressive growing of GAN, just left and right, the coach comparisons. Notice we do see a nice improvement there in visual quality. Now, for quantitative, we did, where it makes sense, we measured inception score. However, it does have its problems with other data sets, so we include FID score as well. You'll notice in the results you're going to see here, we improve generally across the board. We see a slight improvement for CIFAR-10 and Big GAN. And the next slide, you'll see four out of five data sets we improve for FID score. Now, for our poster session, we have since created a feed-forward single-pass method that does even better than this. So please come talk to us, and we'd love to hear. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Melissa Cote from the University of Victoria in BC, Canada. <laughs> Hi. And I'm presenting a texture-based background modeling method for capturing back-of-the-napkin notes. So a good idea can strike at any moment. A back of the napkin idea is typically created on the spur of the moment with a few hand sketch notes on whatever material is available, which often happens to be an actual paper napkin. <clears throat> Sorry. Our goal is to preserve back of the napkin ideas written on perishable media. So given a camera captured image of an actual uh, paper napkin containing hand sketch notes, we want to auto uh, automatically sorry, extract these notes um, to facilitate further processing steps such as handwriting recognition, document vectorization, and so on. Um, hand sketch notes are not limited to text. They can also include drawings, graphics, so we cannot rely on text detection methods. Another issue is that backgrounds may have um, Diverse and salient texture and color patterns, as well as etched patterns, uh, this makes it difficult for document binarization methods. We thus frame the problem differently as a background modeling and removal task. So first, patches are sampled along the, uh, the border of the napkin image at various scales. Each patch is then used to grow a large textured image using texture synthesis. The, uh, the large textured images are aligned with the original image uh, to match the patterns using template matching, um, and then um, cropped to the original size to create candidate background images. Candidate background images are then assembled to create a texture mixture model which represents the napkin background. Finally, pixels in the napkin image uh, are labeled as background if their intensity is similar to that of the texture mixture model. Uh, we remove the background, leaving hand sketch notes. Experiments on a new napkin image data set made publicly available uh, show very promising results. Compared to a well-known baseline uh, document binarization method, our method is more robust uh, with respect to the napkin contents and more stable across all images. This can be verified qualitatively by looking at some sample visual results, as well as quantitatively via a substantially higher average F-score and lower standard deviation. So our approach can cope with any type of hand sketch notes and with flat or patterned backgrounds of low or high saliency. Um, it's also training free uh, as the model is constructed on the fly from the napkin itself. Thank you.
Okay, hello. My name is Lei, and uh, we're the team from uh, Computer Vision Center in Barcelona and uh, Omnias in Berlin. Uh, so, as a supervised training process, so what do we do to train a recognizer for handwritten data set? We would uh, take the data set to split into training and uh, test set and uh, label the training images and feed into the model to train. But uh, could we uh, get a proper recognizer that without uh, labeling any real data? The answer is yes, because we have uh, true type fonts for free and uh, uh, we can generate zillions of uh, data set. And, uh, but the recognizer trained with only synthetic data, it's, uh, it cannot perform well on real data because there's a domain bias between both of them. So now we focus on how to reduce the domain gap. Uh, and about the data set, uh, it's, uh, our handwriting data set is not the same as a natural scene tech, uh, data set because they have uh, fixed size images and the, their ground truths are a single class ID. And for handwritten data set, we have very low length and uh, the ground truth is a sequence of uh, characters. So actually we would apply the uh, domain adaptation on sequence data set. And here's our architecture. And uh, the blue arrows indicate the flow of um, synthetic data with ground truth. And uh, the red arrows indicate the real data without ground truth. And the recognizer is, uh, is a, consists of encoder, attention, and decoder. And to apply the domain adaptation, we use a gradient reversal layer, and then followed by the discriminator. And uh, our discriminator here tries to differentiate the real data from uh, synthetic data. But when the gradient goes backwards through the JRL, it contributes to the encoder just to make them, make the feature representation to be aligned for both domains. In that way, the recognizer can be generalized to recognize the real data. And here is the architecture in more details. Uh, so we have tried our model on five different data sets from uh, historical to modern, including English, French, and uh, Catalan. And uh, there are two rows of uh, transcriptions for, for each. And uh, the first row shows a prediction of the models trained with only synthetic data. And the second row shows a prediction after unsupervised adaptation. And here we have some take messages. And uh, any question or any ideas to work with, just come to my poster session. Thank you. Presenting our work on leaf QA, locate, encode, and attend for figure question answering. Charts and figures are widely used in documents. However, there is limited prior work on querying and understanding these data charts. The key reason for this is lack of corpuses for understanding the chart images, specifically the figure QA and DV QA, which is indicated from synthetic data and hence have limited variations. They also deal with limited types of charts. These figures here, which is a small annotated set of charts, however, it's not scalable to our purpose. We present leaf QA, a real world chart corpus sourced from different public data sets. This has about 200K for training, 40K for testing, and 9,000 images for unseen testing for chart images from data sources not seen during the training time. Hence, our corpus address the key issue of data limitation and the type of charts in the prior corpuses. These are the types of charts in our corpus. These are limits which annotate for each chart image. For each chart image, we also generate dots of questions and answers. The questions are of two types, structural or relational questions. To each question, we have either a common vocabulary answer, which are a fixed dictionary answer like the prior corpus, or we have a chart vocabulary answer, the answers for which are to be given from the chart image itself. This is a peculiar uh, nature of our corpus in which these chart vocabulary answer don't have a fixed dictionary. And for each chart image, the answer needs to be given from that chart itself. The questions are generated using, using templates and uh, each questions are paraphrased for more variation. These are key challenges uh, uh, for our 
these QA data sets specifically handling of uh, infinite vocabulary questions and answers. These are proposed network for handling the challenges in the leaf queue data set in which the network first locates the chart elements and encodes it in terms, uh, encodes the question and string in terms of chart elements, which is then passed to the attention network for question answering. Uh, we uh, demonstrate performance of uh, LeafNet on our data set and compare it with different ablation studies and then show that both image and text are required for question answering in our data set. We compared with, with previous uh, corpuses in which we outperformed the previously proposed methods both on figure QA and DVQA. These are some of the sample output from uh, the proposed network compared with some of the previous architecture in which we show to outperform these networks. Um, hey, I'm Jonathan DeGange. I'll talk to you guys a little bit about our model uh, Deep Erase. Um, kind of like the, the title says, it's going to kind of give away uh, what it is. But uh, so this research really deals with applications of document intelligence. Um, so as you know, in, in industry, uh, there's still a lot of paper processes um, that exist in 2020, uh, from driver's license processing to IDs and documents, uh, tax forms, invoices. Uh, in, re in real life, um, the text to be extracted from a lot of these processes uh, is, is often nestled inside of really rich formatting. Um, and so there's a you know, very complicated task of getting the text out for downstream processes from OCR. Um, and further, the, the text regions can have uh, you know, random ink smudges and artifacts that are just um, laden throughout in, in real life. Um, so despite, you know, in real life, all the presence of artifacts uh, in the real world, um, most of the data sets that we deal with in document processing and in handwriting, IAM, NIST, SDB, um, they're very clean. Um, and uh, many organizations in, in practice in real life might already have a recognition pipeline in place for processing uh, documents like this coming off of scanned processes and things. So <clears throat> the aim of this model was to really try to fix that. Um, at its core, it's really quite simple. We're really just applying a deep segmentation network to try to remove document artifacts from document images. Um, we pretty much use a traditional uh, UNET network, and the network architecture itself is not very complex. It's pretty understandable for those that know the basic framework. I think the difference is kind of in the approach we took to uh, training this network. So our approach is uh, weekly supervised and that we're generating both artifact and image pairs together on the fly during training and then we use that in our segmentation network to ultimately try to remove the artifacts out of the image. Um, so it's somewhat similar to some of the vein of the discussions we've had around kind of a self-supervised approach to, to learning. Um, and so to, to gauge the performance um, essentially we can look at two things. We can look at the performance of the segmentation network itself and how well it's done, as well as the downstream OCR tasks that we're ultimately after. Um, so uh, here you can see a couple of examples of original um, uh, document image with the text uh, with an artifact uh, on the first and third columns, and then the second and fourth you can see where they've been cleaned. Um, and then we capture things like word error rate, character error rate to really show performance, and um, I can talk with you guys a bit more about it uh, my poster is 31 uh, after this. I'm Peter Klammer from HP, and I'll be presenting a novel inspection system for variable data printing using deep learning. This system was developed at HP Indigo Division and is currently being used for 100% print inspection on Indigo presses. There are several challenges for digital print inspection. First one is speed. The Indigo presses produce one B size sheet every second. Uh, maybe a bigger challenge is the idea of variable data printing. Every sheet can be different. So the inspection system needs to handle a wide variety of defect and image types, which are unknown a priori. We developed two different solutions to this challenge. Both methods compare a reference image to a scanned image of the printed output. The first method we call pseudocolor SSD, which maps grayscale versions of the reference 
and the scanned image into a single uh, pseudo color image, which is then fed into the standard SSD object detection network and trained to detect true print defects. The second method uh, we call a change detection SSD consists of twin feature extractor networks operating independently on the scanned and reference images using the VGG16 network up through the pool five labor, lay, layer to generate features. We then fuse these features twice, once after the CON4-3 layer and once after the pool five layer. These fused features are then fed into the SSD multi-scale detection network which detects the full range of defect object sizes. In both methods, the reference and scanned image are first pre-processed to produce aligned and color corrected images. Here we compare results of our classic method. You can see that we have dramatic improvement in false alarm rate. This is a really key for uh, print inspection. Um, ultra low false alarm rate is a critical requirement for print inspection, otherwise operators will quickly ignore an overproductive system. Here we show a few examples of the print defects. You can see a large variety of, of different types. Uh, some that are uh, very low contrast defects where we have slightly lighter print in one area. Those are rather difficult. We have large area defects uh, that, that encompass almost the entire image. We have some that are uh, spot defects that are as small as a millimeter or smaller. So we need to detect all these different sizes. Um, our solution can be generalized. Uh, we have tested this in our paper with an aerial imagery database uh, and have had superior results to what was reported there. So um, come see us and talk to us for any change de detection applications you might have. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Augusto. I work for the Eldorado Institute in Brazil. Um, this, work, this work is the result of a project we did in collaboration with uh, HP, and uh, our focus here is on assessing print quality using computer vision. So our main objective here is to uh, precisely locate, which we call map, so mapping print effects. Uh, <clears throat> so let's say here from left to right, we have like a, a PDF file that you print, uh, so you may have a defect that appears. Uh, so then when you scan the page back and run our method, it uh, should provide a, a map like the one in the end with the defect highlighted, okay? Um, so our main goal here is to provide automated repeatable inspection. This is especially useful uh, when you think about um, heavy duty industrial inspection. Um, so these are the defects that we target in this specific work, uh, dark streaks and uh, color bands. So dark streaks don't have a specific shape but have a distinctly darker color while color bands are more regularly shaped, like a thin rectangle, they're sort of uh, translucent. Um, <coughs> so our solution is based on the two main points. So the first one is the application of deep learning based semantic segmentation. Um, so there's some prior work with a bounding box detection for this problem, but we wanted to get more precise locations and actually counting instances is not very important for us. And uh, the other main point is that we use synthetic data because uh, getting labeled data for this task is very difficult. So for synthetic data, we first model and simulate the defects with uh, image processing, and then we overlay them on top of uh, digital images with around 3,000 background images <coughs> during training, and we apply defects with randomized configuration scheme. We also apply a print scan effect that we model, like a color transformation for that, and our model is based on DeepLab V3+, plus, which is state-of-the-art arch architecture for segmentation. And uh, we have two inference strategies, basically to do with uh, high resolution input images. One is faster and give, gives rough results and the other is the opposite. And here we have some results for our, our uh, no reference approach. So only the defective image is input. So this is a real time demo with a webcam. We place a page in front of the camera. Uh, you can also see here some subtle bending being detected in real time. And then for a quantitative evaluation, we built a manually annotated test set with uh, 30 pages. So we don't achieve particularly high scores, like around 50% IOU, but you have to keep in perspective that the defects are quite thin and subtle. And then we also have a full reference approach where we provide also the uh, digital images as a, to the network, but we didn't get so uh, 
results that were so good. This leaves room for uh, future work. Okay, so hope to see you at the poster session. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Safinia Sherat. I come. I will talk about a low cost, high performance automatic motorcycle helmet violation detection. I work at AIT AI Center in Thailand. In the middle and low income country, we have a problem of helmet violation. Every year, 1.5 million people die in traffic accidents, and more than 50% of this involve motorcycle. The major problem is not wearing a helmet. Organizations like the World Health Organization and Government are trying many methods to solve this problem, such as education. But law enforcement is also an important tool. In Thailand, we automatic the law enforcement processing using camera to detect the violation. In 2016, we start deploying a bed light system that has a camera connect to a machine that perform motorcycle detection, helmet classification, and tracking. When an application file violation is sent email to the Vehicle Information Extraction System to detect and read the license plate and order information about that motorcycle. The evidence is sent to the ticketing system for police to ticket the issue, the t ticket the, to issue the ticket. We immediately saw improvement in compliance at the location where this system are deployed. So we can say that this system is already saving life. But now imagine if we want to deploy the city, the citywide, so we add more camera, like one, two, three, and four. And each application and each camera needs one detection model. State of the art detection use GPU, which are costly. This leads to the idea of optimi optimizing the system to maximize the detection performance while minimizing cost. We are experimenting with a multi camera processing system where multi Applications share one GPU model. Each camera and each application connect to a GPU server using an HTTP, HTTP request and response protocol. Application one, we send an a sequence of image frame according to a buffer size. Then the application get back the detection location for those image. Application two, we do the same, send the sequence of image frame and get back the lo detection location. And then application three, four, up to end, do the same. We return to application one again. Also, one GPU server can have more than one model, and more than one application server can share the same GPU server to further reduce cost. For accuracy, deep learning with GPU architecture is better than traditional computer vision method. And can reduce cost around 20 or 30 percent since it's used fewer GPU resource. For the best performance, we find a uh, certified. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Joachim Foltz. I am a researcher at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, also known as DFKI, and I'm here to present our work on uh, adversarial defense based on structure to signal autoencoders. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with my colleague uh, Sebastian Palacio and supported by Andreas Dingle and Jörn Hayes. Okay, it's well known that uh, neural networks are weak to adversarial perturbations. In particular, gradients obtained via backpropagation contain uh, information, semantic information that attackers can exploit. We ask the question whether it's possible to change these gradients in a way such that they're semantically less relevant and thus less useful for attackers. Our approach makes gradients convey information about the structure of the sample rather than the semantic content. And we start by training a large segment autoencoder on 92 million images from the uh, YFCC uh, 100M dataset. And the reconstructions we get are quite good. In fact, they're so good that if we put our autoencoder in front of, a, for example, a ResNet 50 trained on ImageNet, we barely lose any accuracy at all. And what we then do is we fix the encoder and the classifier in place and only fine tune the decoder. That specializes the reconstruction to the specific classifier and we observe an improvement in robustness to random noise that way. That led us to further investigate the um, robustness to adversarial attacks of these models. And if we look at the gradients that we get that way, if we compare the autoencoder gradients to any of the other gradients, we can see that they're more similar among the autoencoders. And in fact, if we look at the gradients themselves, we can see that they emphasize the structure of the model um, rather than the semantic content. 
And this is then also reflected in the accuracy we get, we get when we attack these networks. So we use FGSM, BIM, and Kalini Wagner attacks to test their robustness, and we can see there's no compromise to clean input performance. However, if we can take a look, uh, yeah, there you go. Our two-step training process that I uh, described before improves performance in a way that sometimes even doubles accuracy. So what that tells us is that we're not really shattering the gradients in any way, but rather reshaping them in a way to make them semantically less useful for the attacker. So to summarize, our structure to signal autoencoders are an effective defense against suggested attacks. There's no compromise to performance for clean inputs. The two-step training process improves the robustness again. We are fully attack agnostic. We can implement them post hoc to existing models, and we're compatible with other defenses that are applied to the model itself. So thank you for your attention. Uh, the Diffuse and End Project and the University of Kansas Auto for funding. Um, NVIDIA for the help via the Invel program. And if you want more, um, find me at poster 37. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is TK from Texas and University. I'm here to present the paper, Collaborating Domain Invariant Learning for Highly Generalizable Large-Scale Reidentification. Personal reidentification is to re-identify a particular subject as the same subject on a previous occasion. The challenge of personal reidentification is the generalization problem to unseen occlusion, multiple scale, low image quality, and luminous change. For example, re-identifying people who wear the same dress captured by different camera viewpoints is very challenging. In this work, we focus on false positive retrieval of objects under the same camera or at the same time step. In sync for a highly generalizable large-scale re-identification method, we present an adversarial domain invariant feature learning framework that explicitly learns to separate identity relating features from challenge variations, where for the first time free annotations in rich ID data such as video time step and camera index are utilized. This feature overfills the concrete chaining workflow of our method, which consists of three modules feature extractor, subject identity classifier, and nuisance classifier. Both subjects, identity classifier and feature extractor, aim to accurately predict the corresponding labels from the learned features. The training of feature extractor strives to, uh, to boost the prediction of outer labels. In practice, we implement the training using an inter interrogative strategy. We firstly tried to stand the adversarial losses, which is reverse gradient and negative entropy. But we found that the reverse gradient will suffer from gradient vanishing when both feature extractor and nuisance classifier initialized from a pre chain model. Then we proposed another loss function, which is called calibrating negative entropy loss. And we found that works best in our framework. The left feature shows the top one accuracy on a single data set and direct transfer from one data set to another data set. And we found that our methods achieve competitive performance on both a single data set and a direct transfer. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Siddhant uh, from IIIT Hyderabad and I'm going to present my work on two-blade precondition solver for bundle adjustment. So what's the motivation behind the work? Recent work in structure for motion has moved towards very large scale theory reconstruction at the scale of million of images, like world level SFM. So the bottleneck in SFM system is the bundle adjustment process as it involves minimization of a highly non convex cost function. So how do we really formulate the problem for a camera K let RKX be the measurement function of a 3D point and MK be the measurement of the point in the camera K. So that's how we defi define the cost function if FKX is equal to RKX minus MK and stacking up for the, all the cameras till Q. Then the bundle adjustment problem can be st stated as finding a parameter vector X that minimizes the two norm of FX. And 
and it translates to solving a bunch of linear equations. So how do we solve the bunch of linear equations is by two methods, that is direct method and iterative methods. So directive methods like this involves Cholesky factorization of the reduced camera matrix, but it's very expensive in terms of the number of unknowns, and uh, that's why we go for iterative methods. So the, the main iterative method that we have used here is called uh, multi-grade precondition, which is used as a preconditioner. So it involves four, five steps, that's smoothing, reducing the high frequency errors, and uh, the next is residual computation, computing the residual after smoothing operation, and then restricting the the errors and then interpolating and correction. So the two grid precondition involves two components, smoother and coarse grid correction. So the so smoother is built by a block diagonal of the matrix by just collecting the block diagonals and the coarse grid correction is involved by a deflation, deflation preconditioner. Deflation preconditioner is built by, by the eigenvectors uh, with the highest eigenvalues. And that's the algorithm precondition solve. First we do the smoothing process and then we do the, that is done by the Jacobi, and then we compute the residual, then we restrict the residual into coarse grid, and after doing solving the coarse grid, we prolongate the solution that is involved in the coarse grid back to the main grid. So the main reason for the fast convergence of our proposed two grid deflation technique is that we explicitly deflate the large eigenvalues instead of the small eigenvalues, because small eigenvalues is really expensive to compute, but as it involves doing the inverse of the matrices. And as you can see, the, here, the largest eigenvalue is in, is in terms of our 15 of order. That's why if we deflate the largest eigenvalues, the convergence is fast. Coming to the results, the time for convergence of full bundle adjustment problems is shown on lifted sure cost function of the sparse, simple sparse bundle adjustment by Christopher Zack. So here we can see that it's a 50% improvement over the direct and the block Jacobi method and two grid is really good enough considering the mean impression error is preserved as compared to the standard methods. Thank you, please visit, visit poster number 49, sorry, 39. Hello, I am Ayush from the Media and Data Science Research Lab at Adobe. I'll be talking about our work in visual compatibility prediction, which is concerned with leveraging visual, visual cues to determine if a set of items go well together in an outfit. So the problem is well researched owing to the immense commercial value and recent methods differ with respect to how they visualize an outfit and what modality of item relationship they prioritize. So one of the earlier methods modeled an outfit as an ordered sequence and used bidirectional LSTMs to learn context specific item representations. Another work models an outfit as a set of pairwise items and uses type specific item representations. The recent state of the art, the recent state of the art models an outfit as an unordered sequence and uses graph neural networks to learn item representations that are conditioned on the item context. So the problem is re results are reported on the Polyvor, Maryland and UIUC datasets and evaluation is done using the fill in the blank evaluation task. So the FITB task takes as input an incomplete outfit and a set of candidate options with the objective to select the best option candidate to complete the outfit. So the evaluation manifests in two forms. First is an FITB original evaluation where all candidates are sampled from, the, sampled from different categories. And next is the FITB resampled evaluation where candidates are sampled from the same category. All existing methods report performance using exactly four candidate options. So first we stress tested, stress tested existing methods by linearly increasing the number of candidates and evaluated both configurations. We saw that while performance for all methods falls drastically by increasing number of candidates, methods that prioritized item context by using graph neural networks showed highest accuracy, and prioritizing item type helped in made representations more robust by decreasing the rate of fall. So we conclude that a compatibility measure that, is, that sort of jointly models multiple measures of item relationship can be helpful. So in this work, we introduce a unified compatibility measure that models multiple modalities of item relationship context, type, and style, and then we leverage ideas from policy gradients and reinforcement learning to learn co sort of composite functions that can unify these disparate compatibility measures. So to model context and type, we introduce a type-conditioned graph autoencoder, where the decoder is sort of measures the compatibility in pairwise type-specific subspaces, and independently evaluating using the TCGA achieves state-of-the-art performance. Next, we incorporate a style compatibility measure through an attentive style autoencoder and use the TCGA decoder to attend on each individual item in the outfit. Finally, we use the reinforce algorithm in reinforcement learning to learn composite dataset specific transmission functions that can learn a unified compatibility score. 
and the results show that the unified compatibility measure achieves state-of-the-art performance. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening, my name is Wing Tao. I'm a research scientist in NVIDIA. And um, doing medical imaging, I'm so glad uh, to present uh, our work, neural ray, neural ray stretching and uh, application for the image uh, segmentation. So in NVIDIA, we develop a medical imaging toolkit called uh, NVIDIA Claro Medical Imaging. And uh, we build uh, uh, the SDK in the um, containers, and you can see uh, we have uh, the annotation, pre the models, transfer learning, and uh, you can develop different applications above the Claro SDK, including registration, distributed training, so on and so forth. This is uh, the framework, framework of uh, our registration. We firstly design a registration simulator to generate uh, all kinds of uh, registration fields. After that, uh, we can sample a uh, registration field from the registration simulator, and we can get the fixed image and the ground truth of segmentation. So we use a unit to parameterize the registration field, and uh, then we can construct the supervised loss for the registration field. And we use a special transform network to calculate the reconstructed image. So we can then um, define the similarity loss function uh, for the appearance, and uh, if we have the um, segmentation ground truth, we can construct the segmentation loss. And we also design a residual block to improve the segmentation performance. And we use the, um, the, re the transform the label as one feature to improve the segmentation. You can see our our registration provides the best registration field and the, both from the registration field of space and the difference image. And we use the supervised loss, it can be optimized smoothly and steadily. You can see on the hippocampus dataset, our result, our method provides the best segment registration performance. And we also get the best segmentation performance, it is even better than the UNET. The registration best segmentation can provide the uncertain estimation and the interpretability naturally. So uh, in this work, uh, we, uh, we propose a neural range and it uh, obtains a 10,000 faster inference speed than other registrations and uh, we also get the best registration and uh, segmentation. And um, it can provide uh, uncertain estimation and uh, inter interpretability naturally. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kishan Sharma. I'll be presenting our work, HistoNet Predicting Size Histogram of Object Instances. This is a joint work between TU Munich, ETH Zurich, and Eerbach Institute. Size of an object is really useful. It can be associated with physical properties such as mass and area of the object. It has application in medical and biology field, where in crowded scenario, interest lies in predicting size distribution rather than finding size of each and every object. One can tackle this problem of predicting size distribution by training an object detector, such as mask RCNN. But we know mask RCNN suffers from the problem of occlusion and overlap in crowded scenarios, and the complexity of this solution is disproportionate with the complexity of the problem. So our objective is to directly predict statistical summary of the object in terms of size distribution histogram and object count. We propose HistoNet network, which given an input image, the fully convolutional lower branch of the network predict, predicts redundant count map based on count section network, and the upper branch predicts size histogram. We train this network by imposing pixel-wise loss on 
object count map and to capture the shape and scale of the histogram, we impose scale divergence and weighted L1 loss between predicted and target histogram. We also present a deep supervised variant of histonet as directly predicting size histogram can be tricky for the network. We enforce direct and early supervision for hidden as well as output layer. We increase the complexity of the task as the complexity of the network increases without incurring any additional labeling cost and we incorporate this in our loss formulation. T minus three. We evaluate our network on three data sets, two of them which are shown here. We also present new fly lava data set, which represent crowded scenarios and consist of 11,000 pixel wise label object instances. As you can see on the right hand side, to show the robustness of our method for variation in size histogram, we created a data set of thin ellipses having large variances in object sizes. Here we show our result on fly lava data set. As you can see, mass carcinian sometimes over predicts and under predicts sizes, while our method and its deep supervised variant really captures the shape and scale of the histogram while having 85% less parameter. Similarly, our method captures scale and shape of size histogram better than mass carcinian for synthetic ellipse data sets showing robustness to size variation. Now this is the overall summary of our result. Our method outperforms mass carcinian and conception method for object counting, as well as we reduce the weighted L1 loss and chi-square distance between histogram more than 50% compared to mass carcinian while having 85% less parameter. Thank you for your attention. For more information, come to poster 43. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm a student at Johns Hopkins University and uh, I'm going to present uh, our work on semi-supervised learning for medical image segmentation, uh, which uh, was done when I was an internship at NVIDIA. Uh, this work is a co-training based approach uh, to address semi-supervised problem. Not really that. And the motivation is that the pixel-wise annotation of 3D medical images are extremely costly and require extra expertise. So why don't we find a semi-supervised learning framework to address this problem? Uh, the co-training is a typical uh, theory for, for semi-supervised learning and have a, achieved great success in multi-view 1D and 2D data. So the co-training assume, uh, assumes at least two views are available and minimize the agreements of view predictions on unlabeled data. And in 3D settings, this view can naturally become the multi -view, multiple viewpoints of 3D data. So we train a deep network on each view and minimize the difference between these views on unlabeled data. So this becomes a additional supervision. We also propose to estimate the uncertainty for each view to compute a reliable pseudo label to, for the back propagation in, on unlabeled data. And this is the overall framework. We first rotate or permute the 3D data and forward into multiple deep networks and get the view predictions. And we can compute uncertainty on each, on each view and use this uncertainty as a weight to fuse them into a more reliable pseudo label for training on unlabeled data. Uh, but for labeled data, we only use the supervised loss. This is a semi-supervised framework. And the first one is supervised loss, and the second one is the co-training loss, and the, sec uh, the third form uh, formula is how we compute the pseudo-label. It's uh, basically a weighted sum of the uh, different, different view predictions, and we validate our approach on three data sets. The first two are popular medical image segmentation data set, and the third one is a challenge, which is a fully supervised setting, and we won the second place in the final testing phase. This is some um, quantitative results. We can see that if we re increase the number of views, the performance will increase as well. And we also give some visualizations, which I believe you can barely see clearly. But you are welcome to come to visit our poster and I will show that clearly. And this is uh, results for another data set. That's all, thank you.
Hi, I'm Liang Zhili from Osaka University. Today I'm going to talk about our work on retinal image segmentation. We propose a model named the Ethernet, which can be used to uh, can use the structural redundancy to make refinement on the segmentation results. Uh, first, let's look at the results from some um, different methods. The first column is the raw image, and the second column is the ground truth label. The third and the fourth are from the unit and the deformed unit. If we look at the second row, which is the one of the most difficult parts in the whole image, we can find that the internet can avoid the noises and connect the vessels together. And this is important for clinical applications because doctors usually pay more attention to vessel level information rather than the PSL level. Although most of people in this area are using AUC, which is a PSL level metric, um, but we think it is not enough for the performance measurement. Actually, the AOC value of the three segmentation results are very close. Therefore, in this research, we want to make a model that can conduct accurate and reasonable segmentation. That is to say, the vessels, the vessels should be connected and the noises should be removed. Humans can make good segmentations because we know that these vessels are connected and can infer how they are connected. So humans can make refinement on their segmentation results. So it will be good if we can give the deep learning models the same ability to refine the segmentation results by themselves. With this idea, we designed the Ethernet model as follows. The red part is the common unit model, and the blue part consists of an iteration of several mini units. And all modules in the blue part are sharing their weights. There are multiple outputs, and each of them uses the ground truth label as the target. The main idea of this de design is to give the refinement model as many patterns as possible. Even with, the, even with one image as the input, they will learn to face multiple instrumentation errors during the training process. Here we show the output from the base module and the three outputs from three refinement modules. We can say that with the iterative predictions by the refinement modules, Ethernet can gra gradually connect the vessels together. We have comparison with the existing methods showing the performance boosts. And uh, here is the experiment results on the drive data set. There are only 20 images in the training set of drive, and the internet achieves the best performance in most of the metrics. Uh, we have published the code as well as the pre-trained weights. We found this model also works well on other data sets without fine tuning. And, uh, even on some other uh, data sets, uh, on the other retinal images. And please come to visit our poster. Thank you. So hi, I'm Uwe Schmidt from the MPI CBG in Dresden. And um, this is joint work with Martin Weigel from EPFL in Lausanne and other uh, collaborators from Dresden and Lyon. So um, localizing and segmenting individual cell nuclei is an important step in many biomedical applications, such as cell tracking in developmental biology, diagnostics in digital pathology, or the de uh, development of new drugs. So instant segmentation of cell nuclei can be very challenging when they're densely packed in noisy images, which is not uncommon in microscopy. And many approaches um, are based on performing semantic segmentation first, which is then followed by a heuristic grouping of pixels into distinct objects, for example, using connected components. But those are prone to erroneously merge touching nuclei. And other popular methods, such as mask RCNN, they first predict access-aligned bounding boxes of individual objects, and then this is followed by a subsequent segmentation step for each object. And they often work better, but they can have problems um, with nuclei whose bounding boxes overlap substantially. So to address this, we developed uh, Stardust, which is a robust and easy to use method for uh, nuclei, in segmenta uh, nuclei segmentation in 2D and 3D. It's uh, specifically well suited for densely packed images, where other methods often fail. And because nuclei are essentially blob-shaped objects, this works well with the star convex shape model that we use. So we predict two quantities per pixel with, uh, with a CNN. The first is the distance to the object boundary along several uh, radial directions, and secondly, an uh, object probability that determines if the pixel is even allowed to vote for an object shape. And as a result, every pixel predicts a star convex polygon to represent the entire shape of the object that it belongs to. And we then use typical non-maximum suppression to remove redundant object instances. 
So in this paper, we specifically described the extension of Stardust from 2D images to 3D volumes. And while 3D microscopy datasets are also noisy and exhibit densely packed nuclei, they're even more challenging due to their size and the fact that they typically have anisotropic voxel sizes. So in order to adapt Stardust for 3D datasets, we demonstrate how to uh, select good radial directions to represent 3D nuclei well. And furthermore, to make this uh, practical for, for large 3D volumes, we compute successively tighter bounds on the intersection volume of adjacent star convex polyhedra to speed up the non-maximum suppression step. So overall, um, we show that Stardust produces excellent results for 3D nuclear segmentation, even in challenging imaging conditions. Um, our user-friendly Python package is available on GitHub and pip installable. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention and come to the poster if you want to learn more. So, hello everyone, uh, I'm Edgar. I'm going to talk about differentiable computer vision. So, let me introduce Cornea. Cornea is uh, an open source differentiable computer vision for PyTorch. So basically in Cornea we implement many of the OpenCV functionalities using the PyTorch operators, uh, allowing us to uh, use all these operators to backprop within the network vendor. So this project comes from the motivation of uh, answering this question. Where is traditional computer vision within the deep learning frameworks? So we realized that there, is a, uh, there was a black hole area in this topic so, and basically for this reason, um, we started this project. Cornea inherits most of the properties from PyTorch, uh, allowing us differentiability. We have a transparent API. Um, it has parallel programming by default, and it also uses the distribute uh, Torch um, API, and it's ready for production. The basic functionalities we have in, in Cornea are the following I'm going to show you, like um, documentation, color space, 2D features, image filtering, and so on. So here are some examples of the dimension features for doing uh, documentation to change uh, the color spaces, like RGB to grayscale. <coughs> so there we have this block uh, for 2D feature detection. Uh, also, we have another uh, module for um, image filtering, for edge detection. <coughs> then we have uh, another module that is for geometry, basically to do warp affines and warp perspective. And finally, we have a whole module for specific loss functions uh, for computer vision. And then also we have uh, some examples showing different uh, uh, problems uh, to do uh, um, backpropagation using uh, the whole PyTorch ecosystem, like as we saw before for uh, um, solving homographies, multi-view uh, multi dev estimation. And finally, we propose also a, a, two, a targeted adversarial attack on two-view matching. So using the, the 2D features uh, module, we show using, for example, the, the implementation we have uh, for SIEV, a defensible SIEV, how to solve these kind of problems. So Cornea, right now, we have uh, almost uh, 2,000 stars in GitHub, 200 uh, force, more than uh, 40 contributors, and we have a permissive uh, um, li um, license like Apache 2. Also, we are inside this uh, whole ecosystem, so if, we, if you have uh, more questions, come by with my, to my um, poster, and I will answer you. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Kung. I'm from the University of Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, our presentation is about uncertainty in model agnostic meta-learning. So the motivation of our work is the current uh, convention machine learning requires a lot of data to accomplish a task, whereas humans just requires like a few training examples. So how can we mimic this unique ability from human to our machines? Second, uh, learning with uh, Less assemble is very uh, difficult because overfitting is a big issue. So how can we include uncertainty into our prediction uh, to prevent overfitting? 
So the problem set up of our few short learning is we are given like T tasks, T training tasks. Each task consists of a support set and a query set. So after the learning, given an unseen task with a few training example, so how can we predict well the unlabeled uh, example within that task? So how can we solve it? We use uh, meta learning in which we learn a uh, prior that is shared across on tasks. So one of the well-known methods in the literature known as MAMO that use uh, direct delta uh, function to model the share prior is denoted as the red dot. Um, so this one is just like similar to learn a good initialization across on tasks. So we extend that capability by using a Gaussian distribution to model the share prior and name our uh, methods as vampire. So next we demonstrate uh, uh, the capability of our method uh, in a regression where half of the tasks are linear and the other half are sinusoidal. So as you can see on the screen, so our uh, method is denoted at a shading area, can predict well the underlying function given only five uh, label data points. In addition, to further investigate the uncertainty, we use uh, quantile regression calibration. So you can see that uh, on the result in the bottom of the screen. So our methods uh, achieve the small lead calibration error across many methods. Similarly, in calibration, we tested on several data sets and we show the result in mini image net. Uh, and our methods on the left can achieve the comparable uh, performance comparing to this